And from the next sentence, responsible Christian men do their part by setting an example of obedience as they put such arrangements into effect. Are we to understand that the expectation of the governing body is, is that the branches around the world will uh, act in accordance with those procedures and guidelines? Uh, that is the expectation, but may I put the proviso on this? You see, as the paragraph 2 starts off, the second sentence, the governing body obeys this direction. Uh, Mr. Stewart, what you need to understand with regard to our organization is a faith-driven organization. It, this is uh, not an organization of lawyers or those that are uh, overly concerned with legal matters. So. Our primary allegiance is to Jehovah God. Now, the governing body realizes that if we were to give some direction that is not in harmony with uh, God's word, uh, all of Jehovah's Witnesses worldwide who have the Bible would notice that, and they would see that it was wrong direction. Uh, there are other scriptural factors that, that may be, make that a little complicated, and it would certainly be a lot easier if we had mandatory uh, laws on that. Now, turning to another aspect that we've dealt with, which is the question of the two witness rule, you will be aware that if there's no confession, then two witnesses to serious wrongdoing uh, are required, or to two similar events of serious wrongdoing, in order that there is sufficient evidence to establish a judicial committee. Do you understand that? I do understand that. Is there a scriptural basis to that? Uh, the two witness uh, testimony, is that yes. what you're asking, Mr. Stewart? Yeah, that's right. Uh, absolutely. If, if I could take you to the book of Matthew, uh, chapter 18. Matthew 18. And that's on page 1330. Matthew 18, yes, and here are the words of our Lord, uh, verse 16, that's correct, uh, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. But in, in, this is talking in the sense of a judicial setting, uh, and if he does not listen, take along with you one or two more, so that on the testimony of two or three witnesses, every matter may be established. So from this, and I can give you a list of several other scriptures, but I don't want to test your patience and take into all these verses. Uh, but basically this is a theme right through the Christian Greek scriptures, the New Testament, that the rules for evidence for a judicial hearing involve two witnesses. But please allow me to say further, uh, this is only talking about setting up a judicial uh, a, a, a committee. Uh, it doesn't mean to say that Jehovah's Witnesses would feel that someone is totally 100% uh, squeaky clean just because there was only one uh, witness uh, to the crime. Well, I'm not sure what you mean by 100% squeaky clean. I mean, the reality is if there's only one witness in the case of child sexual abuse, then uh, it cannot be taken further by the elders and as it's put in the literature, it's left in the hands of Jehovah. Uh, yes, but um, please may I correct your uh, comment on that uh, with all due respect. Uh, you see, by squeaky clean, I'm meaning that it's not like someone being exonerated by a judicial hearing whereby there's double jeopardy and they can't be uh, uh, taken before the judicial hearing again. Uh, it, 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 our literature has said, and we agree, that in most cases with children with child abuse, uh, they are telling the truth. That's an established thing. It's, they're not making up these stories. So immediately the elders would put into place uh, protection measures to help, to make sure that the family cares for the child and uh, that uh, uh, due steps are taken to protect the child. So I take it you say that that is what elders around the world should definitely do. Uh, they should do, because uh, Christian principles indicate if they, uh, if they realize a child is in a dangerous situation, action should be taken. The judicial hearing is simply us determining whether a person 
the perpetrator has committed a sin that would warrant them being put out of the congregation. But that doesn't mean to say we're stupid and that we think that someone uh, hasn't done something. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hope everybody's doing fine. And for those of you that are looking for the answer to the cliffhanger in our last video, this is not it. This is more serious. Yeah, exactly. Hey, Watchtower, don't you wish that the legal systems of this world shared your view of the two-witness rule? You know, friends, that's why it's good that we do a critical examination of the Old Testament because it really helps us to appreciate how this really came about. Well, not only that, but this is what cults use to protect themselves in the modern day world, and it's just not working. No, because when you do a critical examination, you begin to see how all of these laws that these cults hold to do not always necessarily come from God. Well, that's what actually got us to start studying and looking deeper was the Australian Royal Commission. And it's like, you know, um, the commissioner there, you know, they're trying, watch her and, you know, those knuckleheads are trying to throw biblical scripture and this is why we do things. Yeah. Well, you know, our hero. Angus Stewart. Angus Stewart and the commissioner obviously knew their Bible because they were saying no but this is what it says and this is old archaic laws yes so we can see that that's actually where it all started with watchtower trying to defend themselves with the old law covenant right and you know trying to use biblical laws to protect themselves and it's failing miserably worldwide yes. yeah exactly so what it really appears right now is that biblical theology as far as the Washington Bible Tract Society is concerned, is being fought in, in the courts of law. And the more that we can understand how all of this biblical law theology all came about, we have a better grasp of how to point out the obvious to some of these lawyers, perhaps. Yeah. And I want to thank Barbara Anderson um, for sending us the link to this. Appreciate it very much. And, you know, JW's, Jehovah's Witnesses, Watchtower, at what point are you going to realize that this is not Satan and apostate lies and realize you have a serious problem within your organization over this child abuse? You know, you will attack and bash the Catholic Church that they hid it for years, but yet when it comes to you being exposed for having this problem, oh, well, that's Satan and media and apostate lies. It's not true. Yeah. So, so you know, I have to ask, and I've said it before, how can apostates forge court documents, you know, and pressure law firms and stuff to promote these lies? You know, it does not make sense. It's not logical. Yeah. So, and it really appears that Watchtower's stupidity is coming to the forefront because they're trying to argue biblical law, biblical theology in the courts of laws. And thank God, thank God that we have judges in our legal judicial system that are able to see through the Watchtower bullshit. And this is a prime example right here. Yeah. And, you know, we've even um, supplied uh, literature to courts and lawyers where, you know, they claim they don't have a clergy class. But yet in court, they're trying to say that it's the clergy... Um, laity or clergy, yeah, lady uh, You know, confidential privilege, yeah. privilege. And it's like, it's not. You know, you cannot use that excuse in court and then turn around and tell all of your members that you don't have a, cler a, clergy, a clergy lady class. And we've already exposed that in yeah. previous videos. So I guess let's just read what Barbara Anderson sent us from the Nix Patterson and Roach LLP. Yeah, a law firm. April 12, 2018. I'm going to put the link down below to this. Judge orders Jehovah's Witnesses to turn over internal documents related to childhood sexual abuse. Good luck with that one. Well, yeah, because they just they they got fined 
a tremendous amount of money because in California they were ordered to do the same thing and they didn't do it at the cost of four thousand dollars a day. I wish this this judge here would do the same thing. Well, it, and just bleed them dry. It may come down to this. Yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna read their uh, press release here. On April 5th, 2018, Judge James Manley of Sanders County, Montana, ordered the Jehovah's Witness Religious Organization to produce documents and testimony related to internal reports and investigations into the childhood sexual abuse of NPR's two clients. Now, the NPR, that's the law firm's initials. In this case, the two plaintiffs were sexually abused as children by a member of the Jehovah's Witnesses. The elders in the local Jehovah's Witness congregation in Thompson Falls, Montana, were aware of the abuse and failed to report it to the police. And there is the biblical theology because they view it as a sin and not a crime. Yeah. Choosing instead to handle the reports and investigations internally pursuant to Jehovah's Witness guidelines. Their decision not to report the abuse to authorities allowed the perpetrator to remain in the congregation and continue to abuse one of the plaintiffs. Sickening. This very is sickening. Very disgusting behavior. This is very difficult to do before we've even had breakfast. I know. It just makes me sick. Well, I didn't want to do it on a full stomach either. Ugh. <sighs> Throughout this case and similar childhood sexual abuse cases across the country, the Jehovah's Witnesses have refused to produce documents related to their internal handling of reports of sexual abuse and related investigations and disciplinary actions claiming that the information is protected by the clergy penitent privilege and the First Amendment to the United States Constitution. No, it's not. They can claim it. But that's a false claim. Well, you know, several in the XGW community have said, oh, well, what about their human rights? But yet, you know, they're trampling on these abuse victims' yes, rights. They are. Their, their rights to justice. Yeah. So back to the press release. Through briefing to the court, NPR convinced the judge that defendants' privilege claims were unsupported and improper under the law. Mm -hmm. The court agreed that defendants could not blanket everything related to their investigations in secrecy and that they must turn it over to the plaintiffs. Often, this is the very evidence that can win or lose a case like this against a religious institution. The case of Nunez versus Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of New York is set to go to trial in September of 2018. The plaintiffs in this case are represented by NPR partner D. Neal Smith and Associate Ross Leonidas Dacus. So, Newness versus Watchtower Bible Tract Society. Oh. And if we learn anything else or get documents, we will keep everybody updated. And like I said, I'm going to put the link down below to this press release. Yes, and like a lot of us XJWs are... Um, discussing right now is Watchtower's hub and you giving them permission to put your information into this hub. You have a choice to make. We can't give anybody any legal advice, but just recognize that some of us are recognizing that if you hand over this information, you may be losing some of the information that you may need to pursue a legal case if something comes up in the future. So maybe, you know, if you are a an abuse survivor, maybe it would be a good time to contact a lawyer in yes. your area and start the proceedings, you know, before may, yeah. this evidence disappears. And it looks like, we can't say for sure because we don't know ultimately, but we do know that Watchtower has its neck in the proverbial noose and the hangman's hand is on that lever. Exactly. And so, you know, I just want to say something to all of you abuse survivors. You know, we feel, you know, so bad for what you guys have been through, but you are so brave. And, you know, if there's any way that you can, you know, go talk to a lawyer and if, you know, you can get a case started, 
you know, before, like I said, all this evidence disappears, you know, and just know you're not alone, no. that all of us, you know, support you. And my goodness, it's just, it's getting bad. It's getting bad yeah. that all these cases, you know, actually it's good that all of these cases are coming out, but it's bad for Watchtower. Yeah. And, you know, we want to see you victims get everything you can. We want yeah. to see you get justice. And I hope you get every penny that you're asking for. I really yeah. do. See, I really do. you know, and Kim and I have never been victims of childhood sexual abuse from anybody in this organization. That's why we take a different approach. We want to be a support system. We want to be able to have other things available that you might be able to, you know, refer to, call upon, and things like that. And just keep in mind what I said earlier. It strongly appears that Watchtower's only defense is biblical theology. And if we can show an opposing view to that biblical theology to these lawyers, it just might help um, your case in battling this horrific cult. Mm -hmm. So I know a lot of you friends out there looking at some of the previous videos that Kim and I have done as being, oh, Mike and Kim are turning the back on the Bible. No, we're just showing you what the reality is in this book because the Washington Bible Tract Society has done a very good job and making us believe that we understand what the Bible says. But you think about how tired the Watchtown Bible Tract Society kept us through many, many years. You know, you have to go out and serve us on Saturday. You have to go to the meeting on Sunday. You have to prepare Sunday night for your Monday or Tuesday night book study. And, you know, now come Wednesday, you have to prepare for the Thursday night meeting. Now, after the Thursday night and meeting... And service. Yeah, and service. Now, after the Thursday night meeting, you have to prepare for what you're going to say on Saturday morning. And in between all of this, you've convinced yourself by keeping up with your weekly, weekly Bible study that you were reading all of this stuff with an open mind. But instead, you were reading this with a very sleepy mind. And a lot of things that are being pointed to right now are things that I've read in the past, but read with a very tired mind and dots were not being connected. But see, Watchtower tricked us into thinking we were making those connections with the dots and we were not. Yeah. So, you know, and we're sorry if we've offended any Christians in your beliefs. You know, that's not our intent and we don't want to destroy anybody's faith. But, you know, we also feel that these things need to be brought out. You know, these verses and stuff that we're finding in the Bible. And mainly to be used against these cults. Yes. You know, and when we are in contact with current Jehovah's Witnesses so much. Yes. You know, we try to give them evidence that they can use to talk to their family to wake them up. And even if it comes from sharing scriptures about how... Jehovah had a concoction of holy water that would ultimately cause a miscarriage, in theory. Yeah. But it's still something that Jehovah gave to the priests to, you know, come up with another solution when you don't have two witnesses to adultery. Which reminds me, we have to clarify something a little bit better. Yeah. I think you know, because we'll... we've said in the past in our videos, you know, to get a real Bible, you know. And that's probably not the right way we say it. And well, I know it's not we the best way. I know we say things that, you know, offend people, and it's like we don't mean to come across that way, just sometimes when we're really tired. But I just want to share something here. I got this message, and um, I'm not going to say who this is from, but thank you, sweetie. I had to share the news with both of you. My mom bought a real Bible last Friday, and she went through the silver sword, and I was able to show how wrong and fake the JW Bible is because of your videos. Thank you for making your videos and for fighting back all the crap you deal with just to keep your channel going. You have saved another person from a cult. And, you know... We don't save anybody. You guys no. do that yourself. It's your own study. It's your own research. And it's opening your mind to some of the critical stuff that is out there about the Bible and having it make a little bit more sense. Yeah. So we don't mean get a real Bible. You know, that 
it's not a proper thing to say. What we actually mean is get yourself a study Bible or an archaeological Bible because they help you and they insert scholar work so that you can do a deeper study of this stuff. Like, for instance, one that helped Kim and I out early on in our activism against Watchtower is this archaeological study Bible. We were reading some of the scriptures that talk about women having a head covering. And in the Watchtower land, that translates into having a hat. So if you want to say prayer, you, you know, you, you better have a hat. And, you know, getting a little piece of tissue paper in the bathroom and putting it on is not proper head covering. Been there, done that. Ridiculous. Yeah. But when you read the cultural aspect of what was happening, the influence that was coming into the early Christian congregation at that time, that prompted Paul to talk about a head covering, Watchtower took those words out of historical context and made a modern day application, and that is wrong. And that's why it's good to get some different input to what was happening to that culture of early Christians. And what was happening in Corinth is that the prostitutes were shaving their heads bald. Well, the Christian woman decided, well, you know what, I think that looks pretty cool. I'm going to shave my head bald too. And the Apostle Paul is saying, no, 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 no. Your hair is a proper head covering. And we did a video about yeah, that. Yeah, very extensive. So if these Christian women were electing to shave their head bald, it's at that, Paul, at that point that Paul is saying, cover your head because now you've shamed yourself, basically. And, you know, and I've watched the same, I've even watched my own mother do the same thing. Several years ago, it became very fashionable for women to, to pierce their ears completely around the earlobe. That was a worldly trend that kept, that crept into the Watchtower Bible Tract Society congregations. And the Watchtower even made mention of it. But my mother was one who directly brought that worldly trend into the Watchtower congregation. And I even tried to counsel her and she totally, you know, well, balked at it. Well, I told her that at that time, that's what the lesbians were doing. Mm -hmm. You know, and as a full indoctrinated Jehovah Witness, oh, you don't want to look like a lesbian. You, you know, and she had a very short haircut to where it was yeah. like almost shaved on the sides with just a little bit of hair up here. You know, so as a Jehovah Witness, you would not want to imitate, you know, the gay community. Right. So that's She didn't what, care. No, she didn't. And that's why it's good to get some critical thought processes, even some cultural things um, into your study so that you can understand that when a religion comes along and says, well, you know, women have to have a proper head covering, yada, yada, yada. You're not tricked into what Watchtower has done to all of us, even if a woman has a beautiful uh, head of hair, well, you can't take this position as, you know, saying prayer unless you have a proper head covering. And the Apostle Paul is simply saying your hair is your head covering. So that's why it's good to do these things and look at things from not only a critical analyzation, but also a cultural analyzation so that you're not tricked again into another go nowhere cult. Yeah, and that's the biggest thing is, you know, just do your research. Do your research. So when we say get yourself a real Bible, we were mistaken in saying get yourself a good study Bible or an archaeological Bible that's not afraid to show the critical analyzation of what's really going on. Well, you know, analyzing it and learning the cultural part of it, and that's you know, where a lot of us fail to do is we yes. just read the Bible and think we understand it because we apply it to today. And we can't do that. We have to look at cultural things that were going on at that time. And that's why, you know, I enjoy, you know, watching these documentaries and reading these apocryphas and, you know, the Code of Hum Hammurabi, Hammurabi, you know, and the Nag uh, Hamadini, yeah. you know, all of those, because it gives you a more broader picture of what was going on at that time of history. Yes. So, so I hope this helped clears up things. Watchtower, your neck 
is in the proverbial noose and the laws of this country are set to throw the lever. You people need to man up, admit the guilt of your crimes, admit how you've hidden this, because the more you go to court and battle biblical theology, the more you're going to lose. Yeah, and I was going to say, in talking with people one-on-one -on -one and emails and stuff, I do know for a fact there are more lawsuits coming yes. up. And as soon as there is public announcements, we will you know, be doing videos about it to keep everybody update. But there is more coming up. Yes. So... All right, so I guess we actually made this a little longer than we intended because we actually wanted to put all of this into the next video that we're going to do, and I wanted to share those. Well, you're the one that brought it up. I know, so it's my fault. <laughs> so thank you, everybody, and we hope you have a wonderful weekend. And, and I'm going to go finish making breakfast for us. He's so. so sweet. All right, catch mm. everybody later. Bye. Bye.